and welcome to Back to School and Germ Prevention in the New Normal with Lysol. My name is Ruth Athgar, and I am the Professional Services Marketing Manager at Lysol. We are so excited to be able to speak with you all today about germ prevention and healthy habits during what is sure to be a unique back to school year for so many reasons. Thank you National PTA for putting together this virtual convention and for inviting us to conduct this seminar. Lysol is committed to promoting healthy habits and to helping curb the spread of illness in classrooms across the country. This year, the back to school season will present unique challenges that we've never faced before. As the pandemic create, continues to create, as the pandemic continues to create uncertainty surrounding back to school logistics and procedures, Lysol wants to help educate parents, teachers, and school administrators about what they can do to help prevent the spread of germs, both in the classroom and in the home, so that students are able to learn, grow, and thrive this coming school year. The pandemic has changed almost every aspect of our daily life, and we expect the, no, the new school year to be no different. In today's seminar, you will hear from several experts who will share advice and information on germ transmission. They will be sharing prevention techniques to help prevent the spread of germs. Those expert speakers include Joe Rubino, Director of Research and Development at RB, the parent company of Lysol, pediatrician, Dr. Jen Zubler, and Dr. David Berendez, an epidemiologist at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We hope that you find their presentations helpful and informative and that they can help you, your children, and your school districts foster a healthy start to the school year. Before discussing details surrounding school reopening, we have to first understand how germs spread and what we can do to help reduce their spread. Our first speaker, Joe Rubino, is the Director of Research and Development at RB. Joe has over 30 years of experience as a microbiologist and has authored and co-authored more than 50 peer-reviewed journal articles on antimicrobial agents, transmission of infectious agents, and infectious control strategies. From Joe, we will learn how germs are transmitted, the difference between cleaning and disinfecting, and the germiest places in the classroom and the home to be aware of. Thank you again for joining us, and I'll now pass things over to Joe Rubino. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you for the, uh, the introduction. Again, I want to thank the National PTA for the opportunity to speak to you today um, about going back to school and germ protection in the new normal. As Ruth said, I'm a microbiologist. I've been a microbiologist for um, more than half, most of my life. I've been doing this for over 40 years, uh, over 30 years with, uh, with RB and working with Lysol. So we're going to learn about germs. Um, what are germs? So first of all, we know they're microscopic, so we can't see them with the naked eye. They are found all over the world. They're in our bodies, on our bodies, in all kinds of places. In fact, most are beneficial um, and, and harmless. But there are a few that are capable of causing disease, and these are called pathogens. Now, when we speak of germs, we look at them in three major types of biological um, entities viruses, bacteria, and fungi. And they're very different biologically from one another. So we lo lump them together as germs, but they are different. And we'll go into that in the next couple of slides. First, I will start with the bacteria. Well, first, let me... So we know that there are probably countless different species of bacteria, maybe 100 million, and, and that's probably just a guess. Um, but surprisingly, there are only about 1,400 of all these uh, millions and millions of, of bacteria, viruses, and fungi that are known to cause disease in humans, plants, and animals. Now, respiratory infections and GI infections, gastrointestinal infections, are the most common infections worldwide. And if we look at bacteria, they're on a spectrum that go from beneficial and, and harmless to harmful. So we look at the beneficial bacteria. Those are um, important for health. They're found in and on our bodies. Um, they suppress growth of harmful bacteria. They may form uh, substances that um, suppress harmful substances that other 
organisms or the body may produce. They aid in digestion. They enhance immunity. Uh, they're found in our environment and, and play a big role in breaking down organic material to go be recycled. Then there are those bacteria we call opportunistic bacteria. They're opportunistic pathogens. They fit in the middle. Normally they're harmless, but if they get into the wrong environment, um, they may be harmful. And I think a real good example of this is E. coli. E. coli is a bacteria that inhabits our guts, uh, important for us, but the wrong E. coli type or an E. coli going into a different part of the body um, can cause an infection. And then there are truly harmful bacteria. Um, Clostridium perfringes is an example, Staphylococcus aureus, these cause disease. Um, and uh, they're the ones that we were most concerned about um, or very concerned about um, in, in preventing the spread because they do cause um, illnesses. So when we look at bacteria, um, they're, they're living, they take in food, they reproduce, um, they metabolize. And that may sound pretty basic, but you know when we, we'll talk about viruses next and they differ very much from viruses because of that. Uh, we look at bacteria and we classify them based on their shape. So some are round, we call cocci. An example of that are the streptococcus. Uh, others are rod-shaped, we call bacilli, and salmonella is a good representative. There are some that are curved or comma-shaped, and these uh, an example is Vibrio cholera, which is the bacteria that causes cholera. And then finally, we have some that have what we call flagella, they're the flagellated bacteria that help them move around. Uh, and we see there as the bacteria uh, that causes tetanus. They also have a, a the shape of the, of the bacteria is, is uh, due to something called the cell wall. And they stain very differently. And um, we can call them gram positive or gram negative, depending on the type of stain they take up. This does not mean one, one the gram positive are better or more beneficial than the negative. It's just um, the, the, the way we describe the stain um, in bacteria. But this is, as a microbiologist, this is what we learn uh, in day one uh, of, of uh, microbiology class. Now, viruses are very different. They are really biological entities that aren't alive. Um, they're very simple structures. They contain uh, genetic material, either RNA or DNA, bacteria, we, People uh, contain both, but viruses will contain one or the other. They are surrounded by a protein um, capsule called a capsid. And on top of that, in some viruses, there will be an, what we call an envelope. And you can see on the left, uh, on the screen there, influenza virus has an envelope. This is made of lipid material um, that comes from cell membranes or maybe the virus assembles it itself. Um, and then on the other virus, our non-envelope, are, are, have the same genetic material, DNA or RNA, and the capsid, but without that envelope. And this envelope is very important, um, especially when we are looking to control the spread of infection, viral infections or spread of viruses, because on that, uh, on that envelope, you can see there are these um, little um, extensions or receptors or anti-receptors that are like a lock and key that fit into the receptor of a cell that's going to infect and um, that draws the virus into the cell. Uh, and this is an example of that. Uh, this happens to be a, a, a depiction of influenza A virus H3N2. Um, the virus attaches to the cell. Maybe this is a cell in the uh, the uh, respiratory tract where the virus will uh, infect. It gets drawn into the cell because those receptors have a, uh, uh, a complementary receptor on the cell itself that they attach to. Once they attach, they're drawn in. Once they're inside, the virus opens up. The RNA in this case is released and really uh, directs the cell to now produce more virus. So it's almost like a parasitic type of an existence. Um, that it uses the cell, the cell itself to uh, perpetuate um, more viruses. So the cell will, uh, will begin to assemble 
viruses. Um, and then when it becomes full, it bursts out, kills the cell, and the infection starts all over again. So there is no metabolism. There is no food that the virus takes in to reproduce. It is this type of cycle that they have uh, to cause infection. Now, uh, fungi are the last of the germs. Um, real quickly, there are three major uh, ways we can classify viruses or look at them. One is pathogenic, athlete's foot fungus is an example, and um, they cause an infection. They get into the skin, cause an infection. There are non-pathogenic mold, such as uh, that we see causing mildew, and it's more an aesthetic or aesthetic, uh, aesthetic or it may be a, um, could cause damage to surfaces and objects as they begin to grow. And then finally, fungal spores can be released and uh, individuals who are allergic to, fun, to, to mold will inhale the spore and uh, get an allergic reaction. So next we're gonna talk about how germs are spread. There are five major ways we can, we can consider how bacteria and viruses and fungi are spread. One is through the air, through sneezing, coughing, talking. Germs get into the air. Larger droplets will settle down on surfaces close by. Smaller uh, droplets may be carried uh, in the air over long distances. And uh, for example, flu influenza virus will be really in the smaller, the larger droplets that do, they don't travel that far, but drop down to surfaces. Uh, tuberculosis might be an example, is an example of a bacteria that can spread over long distances and be inhaled and cause infection. Then there's vector borne. These are germs carried by animals or in, like insects or rats or mosquitoes. Direct contact is physical contact, shaking hands, um, you know, skin to skin contact uh, could be considered that. Indirect contact is when surfaces and objects become contaminated, either through uh, droplets falling on them or hands that are contaminated that touch them. And then food and water is a very important mode uh, in which bacteria and viruses uh, can spread. So let's look at the, the journey of a germ in transmission. So source would be a person who has an infection, uh, say a cold or the flu, eyes, nose uh, is running, uh, coughing. They can either um, transfer for the, the uh, virus, for example, if it's flu to their hands as they're touching their eyes or nose, or droplets that come out of coughs or speaking can land on surfaces. If it tra goes to the hands, then we will look at the transfer. They touch an object and leave some, leave some of the virus or bacteria behind. If it goes, uh, lands on surfaces directly, um, that, that bypasses the hand contact, the hand roll, and goes directly on the surface. Nonetheless, once it gets to that surface, when another person comes along and touches it, they can pick it up on their fingers, on their hands, and then touch their eyes, their nose, their mouth, these are portals of entry of the, of the uh, organism to get into the body, and then the cycle of infection uh, continues. So now we'll talk about the difference between cleaning and disinfection, because they're both important. Um, helping to eliminate bacteria and viruses on, on surfaces is, is important for family health, and important to help uh, for, in the protection from infectious diseases. Using disinfectants is one of the most effective ways to help achieve this, and they're critical. Now, cleaning and disinfection are not the same thing. Cleaning removes microorganisms from the surfaces, where disinfection actually helps destroy them on the surface. Now, cleaning is not enough, and the reason why is there's several reasons uh, why. Um, cleaning removes a significant portion of microorganisms from the surface, as well as visible dirt. It's not always enough. Without disinfection, some microorganisms can be left behind uh, on the surface, even though the numbers may be small, but the small numbers may be enough to cause an infection. So cleaning alone, followed by rinsing, flowing rinsing water on a surface would be very effective. But we know that's not possible for most school surfaces and objects like desks, tables, door handles and floors, so disinfection is important. Now the type of surface is very important. Um, not all surfaces are the same. New or smooth surfaces are much easier to clean, um, but 
those with few, but, but if they have some perfect imperfections, bacteria can hide in them. Uh, cleaning a smooth surface with few imperfections can produce a real significant reduction in bacteria, well over 99.9%. However, if those surfaces have even some abrasions or some kind of um, ridges, the bacteria can be lodged in there and then cleaning is not enough. Only disinfection will take away the bacteria that have been left behind um, from cleaning as even in those imperfections. The other important um, aspect is infectious dose. This is the amount of bacteria that, um, uh, or viruses that are needed to cause an infection. And it usually varies from organism to organism. But the infectious dose for some pathogens, such as Campylobacter, which causes uh, foodborne illness, or flu, um, or norovirus, which is a very common cause of infectious diarrhea, could be very small. So if we don't eliminate all of them uh, on the surface through cleaning and some are left behind, that surface can still be a, an important um, source of uh, infection. So, and cleaning can also make things worse. Cleaning cloths, sponges, when used, um, especially with a non-disinfecting cleaner, uh, become heavily contaminated and can spread bacteria from one surface to another. Um, using disinfectants can produce a significantly greater reduction in the frequency of contaminated surfaces, as well as um, helping protect that cleaning tool, whether uh, especially cloths, by killing the bacteria before they get onto the cloth itself. So we're gonna talk about high touch areas around the home, and you can see this is gonna be very similar to schools. Uh, pathogens travel uh, through well-defined routes of infection from uh, infectus to a new host. Um, a number of studies have been done to show where germs can be found in the environment and on, on surfaces in homes and schools and, and other settings. Uh, these studies show that surfaces with the high, highest risk of transmitting pathogens uh, really need the most control. And usually these are hand and common touch surfaces, especially those that are touched frequently. This sh shows basically a hierarchy of um, from, from least to be concerned about to most. And least floors, walls, they're not often handled by um, or touched um, by hands and, and pose a, a lower risk. Now I would say in schools, walls, depending on um, you know, uh, how children line up, you know, I, I think it's pretty, pretty common to see children lined up in a hall, leaning against the wall, their hands on the wall. So, you know, it's something to keep in mind when developing a cleaning and disinfection program for a school. Where do children's hands touch? If hallways are seen to be, uh, seen to be a, a source where, uh, of infection because children are touching it frequently, then um, it might be something to take into consideration. However, in a classroom, it may be less of a problem because they're sitting at desks and it's not, they're not touching the wall. Then um, household linens, toilets, baths, sinks uh, become a higher risk. Hand contact surfaces um, such as cleaning cloths, sponges, uh, faucet handles, doorknobs, TV remotes become more of a problem and hands, of course, are the ultimate um, uh, problem that need to be, you know, not, uh, need to be uh, carefully um, cleaned and, and sanitized uh, frequently, especially when there's infection going around. Um, now, infection control in, um, and prevention in, in the home and school settings, um, this shows all of the areas we need to be concerned about, hand hygiene, food hygiene, after we, we touch pets and animals, which could be brought into the school, uh, toilet hy hygiene after using the bathroom, of course, food preparation, um, safe food preparation is important. Uh, diaper changing when uh, there are babies involved. Uh, respiratory hygiene, and these are all important uh, areas to focus on with hand washing, hand sanitizing, uh, with a uh, alcohol-based hand sanitizer, and cleaning and disinfecting. Uh, and I say cleaning because cleaning is important. Cleaning first and then disinfecting. Um, is really the proper steps in uh, rendering a surface 
low in uh, potential for in passing infection. The, the last thing I want to talk about is a hierarchy of microorganisms. Disinfectants with active, uh, bicidal active ingredients um, can help render a surface free of germs. The, but there's, there are dis, different active ingredients um, will have different impact on microorganisms and the microorganism themselves um, also uh, have certain degrees of um, sensitivity or resistance to the biocide. Uh, in addition to the active ingredient, the biocide, the amount that's in there, the concentration that is, the pH of the formula, and some of the excipients that may be in there for helping cleaning or delivering the, the, uh, the active itself can have a role in um, whether how effective it is against killing uh, microorganisms. Now, there is a hierarchy that's well established uh, for human pathogens, including the envelope viruses, as I talked about earlier, and of course, uh, COVID-19 virus. Um, and when we look at this, if we start at the top, bacterial spores, these are almost, uh, if you think about little, um, certain bacteria will produce spores that um, are dormant uh, when the uh, environment is not uh, conducive for growth. So they may be um, resistant to heat and to uh, temperature and drying. Um, they're very resistant. And um, sodium hypochlorite bleach, high levels of, uh, of um, hydrogen peroxide and uh, strong inorganic acids, the type that may be in toilet bowl cleaners are very effective against them. Um, as we drop down, uh, small envelope, non-envelope viruses uh, are the next hardest uh, entity to inactivate or kill. Uh, mycobacteria, the type that causes tuberculosis, although not uh, spread by surfaces, but is something that is um, a benchmark for disinfectant effectiveness and efficacy is next. And phenolic disinfectants, which are found mostly in hospitals, are very effective against them. Then we come to the large non-envelope viruses. Now, many of the uh, common products that are used in the home or in schools are effective. Um, fungi, uh, vegetative bacteria like uh, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, E. coli, and Salmonella uh, are fairly easy to kill, and many, many products on the market today will be effective against them. And then finally, the envelope viruses like influenza, like Ebola, like coronavirus, are actually very, very easy to inactivate with uh, all disinfectants, nearly all disinfectants and antiseptics because of that envelope. That envelope is uh, the key to um, the, causing the infection. It is very easy to remove. And once it's removed, the virus is no longer infectious. And um, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate your attention. Uh, for uh, my overview on uh, germs transmission and how we can control them. Thank you, Joe. We'd like to now shift the conversation a bit to hear a pediatrician's perspective on tips and recommendations for healthy habits as students head back to school. We know the safety of students, teachers, administrators, and volunteers has always been a priority for school systems across the country. And with the impact and uncertainty of COVID-19, taking steps to ensure a safe reopening of all schools is even more critical now. Joining us today to share helpful tips on healthy habits is Dr. Jen Zuzler, pediatric consultant for Eagle Global Scientific and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Dr. Zuzler is also a mom and has been very active with the National PTA. Let's listen to her into her presentation to learn more about what parents and schools can do to help support a healthy and safe return to school. Dr. Jen. Thank you to PTA and myself for this opportunity for me to share with you this virtual experience. I've learned a lot over the past few months about technology and have embraced the benefits that come with it, like being able to connect with many of you right from my home. It's truly an honor to partner with Lysol in its efforts to educate parents and teachers about the importance of instilling healthy habits to help prevent the spread of germs. Teaching and reminding children to practice good hygiene habits 
is especially important now as schools consider plans for reopening and children return to school this fall. And speaking um, of schools, I know a big question for teachers and parents is how and when schools can reopen while keeping children and families safe, given the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. As a pediatrician and a mom, I too have the same question and care about the health and safety of children. I wish the answer were simple, but it really depends on a few factors. One main factor is where you live and the guidance from local and state health officials. We know that children being present for school and doing well in school is connected to their long-term health and well-being. And schools also provide important health and nutrition services that some children don't have access to when schools are closed. So I understand the challenge of balancing two important priorities. One, helping children keep children safe, and two, helping to ensure children are thriving, learning, and getting the healthy support that comes from being present in schools. The reality of the situation that we're in right now with this pandemic is the more people a student or staff interacts with, and the longer that interaction is, the higher the risk of COVID-19 spread. Because of this fact, some schools may consider a phased approach to reopening or even modifying schedules so there are fewer students in the building at the same time. Regardless of the direction they take, it will be important for schools to have protocols in place and communicated to teachers and families to help promote a safe learning environment when they are cleared for opening. There are steps that schools should take to ensure clean and safe environments for students and teachers. The CDC has developed guidance for school communities that is available on their website. You'll also hear more about cleaning and disinfection in school later in the discussion from a fellow presenter here from the CDC. In addition to the steps that schools can take to ensure they are properly cleaned and disinfected, there are healthy habits that parents can encourage their children to practice now and when they return to school to help reduce the spread of germs and viruses like COVID-19 and the flu. As a pediatrician, I've seen countless patients and families with colds, flu, and infections that come from exposures to viruses and bacteria. And we've learned that these are commonly called, as, called germs. We can also see how healthy habits benefit families. So why do kids not practice healthy habits? Well, it's arguably because they're kids. So it means that we as the adults must be in, intentional and diligent in reinforcing and teaching healthy hygiene habits at home and in schools to decrease the spread of germs. I'd like to share a few reminders with you as parents and teachers to help as you teach and encourage healthy habits and hygiene. In addition to the flu vaccine, CDC recommends taking these everyday prevention actions to help stop the spread of germs. Encourage staying home when appropriate. Teachers, staff, and students should stay home if they're sick, have tested positive for, or are showing symptoms of COVID-19, or recently had close contact with somebody with COVID-19. As a parent, I know it's not always easy to keep sick children at home, and you want to ensure that they're not missing out on learning, but it is really important for their health and to help avoid the spread of germs. And teachers and school leaders, please encourage this behavior as well. Support parents and students with distant learning opportunities when possible, and consider how rewards like perfect attendance are determined. Encourage and teach proper hand washing, so teach and reinforce hand washing often with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, especially after coughing or sneezing. If soap and water are not readily available, hand sanitizer that contains at least 60% alcohol can be used with staff and older children who can safely use hand sanitizer. Teach proper sneeze and cough etiquette. Encourage staff and students to cover cough and sneezes with a tissue. Used tissue should be thrown in the trash and hands should be washed immediately with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. If a tissue is not available, cover your mouth and nose with the inside of your elbow and sleeve, um, not with your hand. In general, remind children to avoid touching their eyes, nose, or mouth since we just learned that germs are easily spread this way. Remember to disinfect. 
Remember to clean and disinfect frequently touched surfaces, especially when someone is ill. When practiced, these hygiene habits can help protect children and teachers and slow the spread of germs in school communities. And with the COVID-19 pandemic, teaching and reinforcing the use of cloth face coverings is important. Cloth face coverings are meant to protect other people in case the wearer is unknowingly infected does not have any symptoms. Face coverings should be worn by staff and students, particularly older students, as feasible and are most essential in times when physical distancing is difficult. Face cloth coverings may be challenging for some students, especially younger students, students with sensory issues, students with disabilities, or certain health conditions to wear all day in settings such as schools. Students should be frequently reminded not to touch the face covering and to wash their hands frequently. Information should be provided to staff, students, and students' families in the proper use, removal, and washing of cloth face coverings. It's important to remember that cloth face coverings should not be placed on children under two years of age, anyone who has trouble breathing or is unconscious, anyone who's incapacitated or otherwise unable to remove the cloth face covering without assistance. To help teachers and parents with reinforcing and teaching healthy habits and hygiene, Lysol's Healthy Habits Program offers free lesson plans on its website that's listed here. I share these materials with parents and teachers and I've used them myself. And they're great tools to educate students about minimizing the spread of germs and creating clean, safe environments. These materials are free and able to be downloaded. I've also included a few additional resources for families and schools on the screen. Um, one is from the American Academy of Pediatrics parents website called healthychildren.org. And the other are CDC resources. CDC has a COVID-19 um, website with multiple pages. These are just a couple um, that are highly useful for families, but there are many more. So the ones that I've pointed out here are protecting yourself and others, slowing the spread of COVID-19, coping and resilience, and care of children. In addition to having plans in place to keep students safe, there are other factors that school communities should address to support the health and well being of students in response to the impact of this public health pandemic. First, support mental health. Mental health support should be available to all students to help them cope with stress from the pandemic and to be ready to learn. Students may be grieving from the loss of loved ones from the virus, dealing with the pressure of catching up, as well as missed experiences and the stress of financial struggles at home. School mental health professionals can provide critical support and teachers and staff can be trained on how to talk with and support students who show signs of anxiety or distress. Second, consider students with disabilities. The impact of schools being closed may be greater for students with disabilities. They may have a difficult time transitioning back to school after missing out on instructional time, as well as school-based services like occupational, physical, speech therapy, and any mental health support and counseling. AAP, the American Academy of Pediatrics, recommends reviewing the needs of each child who has an IEP, determine if they have any new needs, and starting services, even if they're done virtually. Third, remind families of physicals, of annual physicals with their healthcare provider. The Academy of Pediatrics encourages families to continue seeing their pediatrician for checkups and for immunizations. Practices are providing safe ways to accommodate families, catch up on checkups, and provide healthcare virtually or in person with your trusted healthcare provider. However, the COVID-19 pandemic may have impacted some pediatric practices. With this in mind, school districts may need to consider changing or extending the required start of school medical paperwork for families. And lastly, nutrition will also continue to be important. Many schools have continued to provide nutritious meals to families during the pandemic. If students are doing distant learning, this will continue to be important, especially with families who are facing job loss. 
The U.S. Department of Agriculture has given school districts with meal programs more flexibility during the pandemic. They can offer meal service outside of settings like cafeterias and provide food for several days of meals at once. It will take all of us working together to ensure a safe return to school for students and for teachers. I appreciate you all for taking the time to tune in today. The work you're doing and the support you're providing to families and children to ensure a health and saving, safe learning environment and community is incredibly vital. So thank you for your investment in children and schools. Thank you, Dr. Zubler. As important it is, as it is for students and families and teachers to practice healthy habits, it's also just as important for schools themselves to take precautions. Our final presenter will be Dr. David Brandes, epidemiologist on the Global Water Sanitization and Hygiene Team of the Waterborne Disease Prevention Branch at the CDC. Dr. Brandes conducts applied research focusing on sanit sanitation and hygiene associated exposures and their impact on health, as well as the increasing role of the environment in transmitting antibiotic resistant organisms. He will take us through best practices for returning to the classroom in order to help our students and communities enjoy a safe and healthy back to school season. Hello, and thanks so much for having me. My name is David Berendez, and I'm an epidemiologist and a hand hygiene subject matter expert at, his, at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. This presentation will focus on promoting hand hygiene and cleaning and disinfection in schools, with a focus on COVID-19 prevention given the ongoing pandemic. To give you an outline of this presentation, I will start by going over how COVID-19 spreads and behaviors that can be taken to reduce its spread. Then I'll discuss ways to promote hand hygiene as well as cleaning and disinfection in schools. Finally, I'll end by providing some CDC resources that may be helpful to you as you navigate these issues. Okay, let's start with some background on COVID-19, how it spreads, and steps that can be taken to prevent it. COVID-19 is a respiratory virus that's thought to primarily be spread from person to person, especially when people are close together, for example, within six feet. It spread, spreads by our respiratory droplets, which are produced when an infected person coughs or sneezes, and then can land in the nose or mouth of nearby people who can inhale it into their lungs. People without symptoms may still be able to spread COVID-19. Additionally, people may be able to get COVID-19 from touching surfaces or objects that have the virus on them and then touching their mouth, nose, or eyes. When we think about how to reduce the spread, these are the types of behaviors to consider. For example, a school could educate and actively encourage staff, students, and parents to stay home when sick in order to stop from spreading COVID-19 to others. They can develop policies that support and reinforce this message throughout the school and specifically for the staff, students, and parents. As Dr. Zubler mentioned, for example, a student school might choose to not have perfect attendance awards. The school can teach about hand hygiene, that is when and how to wash hands appropriately, and respiratory etiquette, covering your nose or mouth when sneezing or coughing. They could put out signs to remind staff and students to wash hands frequently and ensure that soap, water, and drying materials are always present and stocked in bathrooms and classrooms. As schools teach and reinforce the use of cloth face coverings, we should take care to note that face coverings may be challenging for students, especially the younger ones, to wear all day in settings such as a school. Face coverings should be worn by staff and uh, students, particularly older ones, as is feasible and again, just to reiterate, are most essential in times when physical distancing is difficult. Cloth face coverings, again, should not be uh, placed on any children younger than two years old. Anyone who has trouble breathing or is unconscious, or anyone who is incapacitated or otherwise unable to remove the cloth face covering without assistance. As schools teach about these behaviors, school administrators can reinforce these messages by posting signs in visible areas such as school entrances and restrooms. These messages could also be shared in emails and on the school's social media pages. CDC has free print and digital resources that you can use and we will share with a web link at the end of the presentation. 
Okay, let's talk a little bit about hand hygiene specifically. Schools should teach and reinforce for students and staff that they should wash their hands for at least 20 seconds with soap and water. If soap and water are not readily available, staff and older children with supervision can use alcohol-based hand sanitizers that have at least 60% alcohol content. Encourage staff and students to cover coughs and sneezes with a tissue, throw that used tissue away in the trash, and then wash their hands immediately with soap and water for 20 seconds. Schools can play an important role in promoting good health and hygiene practices by providing easy, frequent opportunities for students to wash hands. Ideally, they should ensure that soap, clean running water, drying materials, tissues, and trash cans are available and easy to find. Consider providing alcohol-based hand sanitizer at locations where soap and water are not readily available, such as a dining hall that doesn't have a sink, and supervise students while they use it. Additionally, schools can use all sorts of media to promote healthy habits. They can post signs in visible locations, such as restrooms and school entrances, that promote everyday protective measures and describe how to stop the spread of germs. They can include healthy habits to prevent COVID-19 as part of their daily broadcast announcements, as well as share materials digitally by email and on websites. Again, CDC has free communications resources for COVID-19, um, that I'll share at the end of the presentation, and there's a link also on the bottom of the slide. Now let's talk a little bit about cleaning and disinfection practices. I want to start, start by giving you a few of the overriding principles that we use in developing our guidelines. First, a few definitions just to reiterate what Dr. Rubino had started with. Cleaning is the act of using soap and water to remove dirt and debris. It's a necessary first step if surfaces are visibly dirty or otherwise soiled and can reduce the amount of germs. Sanitizing is the use of a product that reduces the amount of germs to levels considered safe by public health codes, for example. Children's toys are often sanitized since that, that is a less aggressive process than disinfection and so may be safer in terms of the chemicals used than disinfection for objects that children want to put in their mouths. Disinfecting is the use of a product that more completely or thoroughly destroys or inactivates germs on objects and surfaces. We know that schools are balancing so many demands right now. So cleaning and disinfection should be done as effectively and efficiently as possible each time. You should clean a surface if it is dirty, then disinfect it. For disinfected products, use those on list N of EPA's registered disinfectants since those have been deemed effective against coronaviruses. Follow manufacturer's instructions for applying the product and for how long to leave it on the surface. Finally, I wanna note that CDC has guidance on our website about how to use simple everyday household bleach to disinfect appropriate surfaces if you don't have the products listed on list N on hand. We often get questions about what to be, should be disinfected. To be efficient, focus on frequently touched objects. For example, doorknobs, light switches, faucets, and sinks, and other, other surfaces. Surfaces that are not frequently touched with hands, such as floors and sidewalks, and areas that have not been used by anyone in the last week, likely do not need to be disinfected. Be sure to clean and disinfect safely. Ensure that you or your staff are using cleaning and disinfection products according to the manufacturer's instructions. This includes instructions for appropriate use, concentrations of the product, its storage, and personal protective equipment needed specifically for the product. Ensure there's sufficient ventilation for the products and do not use cleaning and disinfection products near children. In preparing to return to school, one of the most important things a school can do is develop a plan for cleaning and disinfecting. To develop this plan, take an inventory of what surfaces or objects exist that are frequently touched that you would want to clean and disinfect regularly. Keep in mind that some objects, such as those that are porous or soft, cannot be cleaned, sanitized, or disinfected appropriately, and it may be best to remove some of those objects before the children come back in. Once you have that inventory of what you want to clean and disinfect, implement your plan. Clean and disinfect regularly or frequently 
touch surfaces and objects at least once per day and between uses as much as is possible. A special attention to include surfaces not only within the school, but also in vehicles such as school buses. Drinking water fountains may be particular points of concern and may require special attention and more frequent cleaning and disinfection. If possible, schools might even consider encouraging staff or students to bring their own water if they want to minimize use. While in school, discourage sharing of items, especially those that are difficult to clean and disinfect between use, such as pencils or markers. This may mean ensuring that there are enough supplies of those frequently touched objects so that everyone has their own. One additional important planning step is to plan for what to do if someone gets sick with COVID-19 while in school. If someone gets sick, sick at school, close off the areas used by them for as long as possible and up to 24 hours if you can before you clean and disinfect. You can also open outside doors and windows to increase air circulation that can help move the virus out of the school. However, don't open windows or doors if it would pose a safety or health risk to the children. After waiting, clean the area and disinfect using the products from List N that I talked about before, following those principles that we outlined. For example, focus on cleaning and disinfecting frequently touched surfaces in the area. Finally, I want to draw your attention to one new development that may be of interest in terms of health education. As part of our response to COVID-19, CDC is using this opportunity to recommit to improving hygiene education in schools. Very soon, you will see new additions to the Health Education Curriculum Analysis Tool, H-E-C-A-T or HECAT, that is published by CDC's Division of Adolescent and School Health. These additions focus on age-appropriate hand hygiene and cleaning and disinfection competencies that can be added to health education curriculum for students. For hand hygiene, they focus on when, how, and why to clean hands, and the differences between washing hands and using hand sanitizer, as well as when to do each. For cleaning and disinfection, they focus on how these products work, but also how to stay safe around these chemicals. We hope that COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic gives schools an opportunity to bring students, parents, and staff together to maintain a healthy school environment. With that, I'll end by thanking you for your time and share this list of resources on COVID-19, which provide further information on some of the topics I outlined. I wanna send our best wishes for a happy and healthy school year. Thank you, Dr. Berenda. We've heard from a great lineup of speakers today. And now we want to help answer some of your questions um, that National PGA has provided us with regarding healthy habits and back to school during the pandemic. The first question I'm going to ask um, is to our expert, Joe Rubino. The question from PGA members is, as follows. Most adults can socially distance and comply with rules about wearing masks and avoiding touching others, etc. But it's harder for younger children to remember this and to really understand the implications if they don't. How can we talk to younger children about healthy habits in ways that will resonate with them? And are there resources available that can help them understand without scaring them in the process? I mean, it's a very good question, uh, Ruth, and, and thank you from uh, PTA uh, for this question. I think we just heard um, from Dr. Zuber and Dr. Brandeis about some very good tools that are available uh, for schools for education. But I would, I would start by saying, you know, um, teaching hygiene in school is something that's very important. We would, should start with just teaching children about germs. You know, let them learn, uh, have them learn about germs, how they're spread, what they are, um, the role hands play in spreading germs as you touch surfaces or touch other objects, how you can pick them up. Um, the importance of hand washing, we've heard a lot about that, but it is very, very important. It's the first thing we need to do, our first step in preventing infections from spreading and why that is. Um, proper cloth etiquette, is important and bring this sense of that you're doing this as a as a something to help protect not only you but your classmates your friends your family you know give it give 
give them um, perhaps a, a superhero type of a, um, uh, you know, endeavor that they're doing, that they're taking on. They're superheroes in stopping the spread of disease. Now, there's a tool that we use frequently in, in helping um, children understand the spread of germs with a powder called Blow Germ. It's a harmless powder that uh, can be put on hands or objects. Um, it simulates the way germs can spread. It glows a, a bluish color under a black light. So in regular light, it's invisible, and under the black light, it's, it glows. And you know, we've done this by you know, putting glow germ on balls or on pencils, passing it around. Um, and then you go back and you show the children, oh, look, here's where the, uh, you touched this ball or you picked up this pencil. And look, if that was germ, if those were germs, look what you would have on your hands. It's also a nice tool to show proper hand washing by eliminating um, the glow germ from the hands. You would be doing it properly to eliminate uh, bacteria or viruses from your hands. So I think there's some, some basic education, it has to be age appropriate, about germs, about hygiene, with some demos that can be, uh, can be done. And uh, I did provide a list of other resources uh, from RB uh, on our um, Healthy Schools Initiative. And I think, um, uh, Ruth, we can put that up. And uh, there are also some other uh, websites. Uh, another one that uh, there's some good ones from CDC, but one from the American Cleaning Institute on uh, a healthy school program that also has some curriculum ideas and some educational, uh, you know, programs for children in schools. Wonderful. Thank you, Joe. Great, great answer. Um, our next question is for Dr. Jen. Um, the question is, what are the most important facts parents and their children should know and discuss together about the pandemic? And how should parents really approach these types of conversations? Well, thanks, Ruth. So you really just want to be as honest as possible and answer whatever questions that children have and make them developmentally appropriate. Sometimes we want to answer or give them information that they're not even asking for. So especially for young children, you know, answer the question that's asked, answer it honestly, let them know if you don't know the answer and you can try to find it out together. Um, there are lots of tools and resources about how to have these discussions with children, including children's books that can be helpful for these conversations. And for older kids, um, of course, they're gonna be exposed to a lot of media. You really would like to limit the amount of media that younger children are exposed to because it's scary for adults and it can be just as scary for young children, especially when they don't understand um, most of, of what's occurring in, right now. Um, so I would really try to limit media for young kids. And again, for the older kids, they're going to be exposed to it. They have their different devices. And so making time to discuss things that they're reading about and seeing online is very, very helpful. And try not to minimize their losses. So, you know, things like going to school, hanging out with friends, missing sports and other types of activities can be really impactful at this age. So we, we want to acknowledge that um, and reassure them as much as possible. You wanna reassure all kids and let them know that you and their teachers and their community are doing everything to keep them as safe as possible. You wanna reinforce the fact that most children who contract the virus are not going to get very sick or sick at all. Um, and then children oftentimes will worry because we've been talking about this so much that anything that they're ill with or even allergies and things like that mean that they have COVID-19. So you wanna reassure them that, that even though they have symptoms, it doesn't mean that they have COVID-19, but you as a parent will go and make sure that they get any help that they need. Um, so really trying to reassure their fears, answering their questions, um, and then trying to establish healthy routines in the family because routines are important for all of us. Making sure that kids are getting enough sleep, good nutrition, they're getting outdoors, um, and that they're taking time to stay connected with others. So relatives, friends, whether it's virtual or um, distance um, and keeping six feet apart wearing masks, but we wanna make sure that we're staying socially connected for our kids. Our last question is for Dr. Berendez. The question is, many school administrations are implementing policies to help reduce the spread of COVID-19 when the schools reopen. Based on CDC guidelines, 
what are some considerations schools should keep in mind when determining when, how to reopen? And what can parents and students do to help with this? Great question. So in addition to the resources that we went through and that you can find online, in particular, I wanna highlight that CDC has developed considerations for schools, which is a document that covers categories of risk, ways to reduce spread, healthy school environments, healthy operations, and what to do when someone gets sick specifically. Additionally, CDC has recent, recently released the School Readiness Assessment and Planning Tool, or RAP. This tool guides schools through a process to determine if various strategies are in place to be prepared to reopen in the fall. You can find that on the CDC's coronavirus website under the Schools and Child Care section. And in the near future, working on right now, CDC will have communications materials available specifically for parents. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Brenda. And I'd like to thank all of you for attending our Back to School and Germ Prevention in the New Normal uh, workshop with Lysol. I'd also like to thank our speakers for joining us and sharing their expertise on germ prevention. The past few months have presented us all with unique challenges, and we hope you will share today's learning with your children and your schools to help promote healthy habits and to help prevent the spread of germs. For those participating in the PTA Snap It Challenge, please remember to do a selfie with the following slide. Thank you, have a great school year and stay well.